Welcome back to the Der Show. I hope those of you who watch the uh, tour of my uh, Florida apartment with all my tchotchkes and all my memorabilia and the uh, Jefferson and all that stuff, I hope you enjoyed it. If you um, missed it, uh, you can still get it, obviously, um, online. So I hope you would enjoy it. Uh, just uh, one moment reflection on Tom Brady, who I've been watching since he first came to the um, uh, New England Patriots. Uh, I had a tiny, tiny, tiny role to play in Belichick's uh, coming to the Patriots, and I've been kind of a friend of the Patriots and, and the owners for a long, long period of time. And Brady's retirement is really the end of an era. Uh, I think uh, Mahorn is um, really, really, really good, but uh, Brady's accomplishments, his rings, his uh, ability uh, to bring uh, the team back from deficits uh, really has been unparalleled in football in football history. Football won't be the same as him. And I know he's had some tough personal issues in his life. And I just uh, wish him the best and thank him for all the joy uh, he, he brought to me, winning or losing, mostly winning. Uh, if you're a Patriots fan, I know a lot of people hate the Patriots, but uh, I was a loyal Bostonian for the 50 years I lived there. Red Sox, Bruins, Celtics, uh, Patriots. I went to all their games. Uh, big sports fan. One of these days we'll do a show just on sports. And I'll ask you some really, really hard, trivial questions about sports that I would challenge you to come up with the answer, but we're going to put that off today. We're dealing with one of the most contentious, difficult, and in many ways insoluble uh, problems and very important, very important problems. How do you teach public school students? Remember, public school students don't have a choice. They're in school. They're compelled to be in school by law. Um, every state is a little different, but usually through high school or through the age of 16, 17, or 18, they're a captive audience. And, um, and uh, many people can't afford to go to private schools, so they go to public schools. And uh, how do you teach them, if at all, about race, um, about uh, gender, sex, uh, and other extraordinarily uh, controversial issues? Uh, one thing that's clear is we're doing it all wrong right now. And it percolates not only through elementary school and high school, but in college. Uh, I taught at Harvard for 50 years. I taught at uh, several other universities as a visiting professor. Education is broken. Uh, higher education is broken. Uh, middle school is broken. Uh, elementary school is broken. Um, it's become today a propaganda mill. Um, the vast majority of teachers, particularly at the high school and college level, are uh, leftists, and uh, many of them hard leftists, uh, progressives. Um, the number of conservatives, particularly in, in colleges, um, is very, very low indeed. Um, and uh, life is not easy for those who are um, conservatives. And many of the teachers, uh, the hard left teachers, feel a moral obligation not to teach their students how to think, but to tell them what to think, to propagandize them, to uh, instill in them uh, the same leftist values uh, they have, and understandably, uh, parents object to it. They're afraid to speak out about it. I've had many parents call me uh, with students in uh, high school. Um, um, I had one particular set of parents at the Friends School of New York who called me. They were, they were just furious. The school was a propaganda mill. They weren't teaching math and science. Uh, they were teaching, you know, Palestinian rights, and they were teaching intersectionality and, and, and critical race theory to these kids and telling them uh, that they're all racists and, and things of that kind. And I said, why don't you complain to the administration? And their answer was always the same. Oh, no, we can't do that. It would endanger uh, the chances of my kid getting a recommendation from the school to go to the college of his choice. So there's a coercive element here that's really just just awful. And, um, you know, what I hear, uh, I haven't been teaching now for 10 years, although I still occasionally give a lecture, um, is that it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and that um, political correctness is rampant on campuses. Students who have different views are afraid to speak up. Um, some are afraid of just social pressure. Some are afraid of being graded down by their, by their teachers. And I hear so many stories uh, about this from so many different people from different perspectives. And we're not talking about, you know, right-wing, hard, 
conservatives, we're talking about centrist uh, people who are either centrist liberals or centrist uh, conservatives, but they're not radicals and they're not, quote, progressives, as you know. I think people who call themselves progressives today are among the most regressive group in America. They're in favor of censorship. They're against denial of, uh, they're in, in favor of denial of due process. They're in favor of canceled culture. Um, they're in favor of propaganda. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's nothing progressive about that at all. You go back and read about Teddy Roosevelt, the founder of the progressive movement, and Roosevelt wouldn't uh, recognize these uh, radical, tyrannical Stalinists um, who um, strongly believe that if you uh, get the minds of students at a young age, uh, you can have them for the rest of their lives. We've gotten them. That's an exaggeration. People do change their minds. But teachers have no right to uh, express uh, their own views inside the classroom. I taught for 50 years at Harvard, and students could never know what my own views were. Uh, for example, I've been a lifelong opponent of the death penalty, but when I taught criminal law, I played the devil's advocate and I supported the death penalty. I made strong arguments in favor of the death penalty so that the students could try to respond to them. And that way I helped to build up their ability to make uh, arguments. I would ask students when they stated one point of view now to make the argument on the other side, to teach them an ability to assess and appraise all sides of an issue, something that uh, today is not being taught um, in, in, in many law schools uh, and certainly many colleges. But I want to talk more about elementary school and, and high school. Now, look, we live in a society where race matters and we live in a society where gender matters. And we live in a society where kids at a very young age are engaged in uh, sexual activities. And so it's important that they learn about the race, uh, gender, and, uh, and sex, uh, the question is who teaches them. Um, I don't believe it's the job of the public school to educate kids about sex. I think that's the job of the family, that's the job of the church, that's the job of friends, that's the job of uh, the private uh, sector. But to give a public school teacher the right to uh, lecture students about um, transgender, about uh, gay rights, about a range of other issues. It's it's just too private and too personal, and uh, and it doesn't have very much to do with uh, your ability to do math, science, geography, and, and and history, which is what I think the focus uh, should be. But uh, even when you limit yourself to to say uh, you want to talk about history, certainly civics and history are appropriate subjects. So, well, how do you teach that uh, when? There's no consensus in America about our history. Are we, are we a systemically racist country or are we not? You know my views. I think we're a systemically anti-racist country. Uh, our systems are all geared against racism. There's still plenty of racists, but uh, they don't have the support of the government. They don't have the support of uh, uh, corporations. They don't have the support of academic institutions. When I was growing up, there was systemic racism. Harvard was a racist institution. Um, and uh, Yale was a racist institution. Um, they had quotas uh, based on, you know, whether you were Jewish or Catholic or, or in some cases, even Canadian, um, uh, all kinds of quotas. Uh, you know, just, just 10 years um, before I went to uh, college, um, um, the United States excluded, uh, uh, detained um, 110,000 uh, American citizens, mostly American citizens, uh, all American residents, on the ground that their ancestors were Japanese, they had Japanese heritage. Uh, purely, purely racism until 1954, I was 16 years old, schools were officially segregated and the law uh, allowed that under Plessy versus Ferguson. That was systemic racism. When I applied to law firms and every single law firm turned me down, even though I was, you know, I was the number one draft choice uh, by NBA standards. I was first in my class, editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal, Supreme Court law clerk, uh, about to get a teaching position at Harvard. How could you be more qualified to work in a law firm? And I'm a you know, pretty damn good lawyer in terms of practical street smarts. Not a single law firm would hire me. That was systemic racism. We don't have that today. My son who graduated Yale uh, 25 years after me, got all the jobs in the world. He, he wanted uh, his Jewishness was not a barrier or a factor. Uh, it changed. Uh, um, it went through a period. Uh, first, the United States was systemically racist. 
then we were kind of neutral. Now, particularly following the George Floyd case and other cases, we are systemically, systemically committed against racism, maybe, maybe to an extreme, but nobody rational can say that systemically we are still uh, racist. Uh, we're not. That, it's as simple as that. But teachers are teaching that we are. And um, teachers are teaching that all, right pe all white people are inherently racist and black people are not. Um, they may have a little problem with the Nichols case um, where this uh, young African-American boy was murdered uh, by policemen who were black. Um, but, uh, you know, teachers teaching it. Uh, there's this, uh, uh, the two concepts that they're teaching now in high school and in college are uh, one, critical race studies, and the other, um, intersectionality. Let me explain what they are and tell you how pernicious they are. First of all, critical race studies basically sees everything through the prism of, of race. And the one thing it's not is critical. It's never critical of race. Uh, you don't see a syllabus um, of critical racism where, ra where, where black leadership is really challenged and, 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 and questioned. Maybe occasionally you'll see Malcolm X uh, criticizing Martin Luther King because he wasn't radical enough. But you know you don't see critiques of Black Lives Matters. And you know Black Lives Matters is uh, has become, uh, you know, an, an institution. It was Eric Hoffa, the philosopher, who said, it starts as a cause, it becomes a movement, then it becomes a business and ultimately a racket. Uh, what phase Black Lives Matters is at now is a matter of degree, but it certainly has become a business. And for some people, we know it has become a racket. And, you know, they've been uh, interestingly silent, not silent, but not nearly as, uh, as, as vocal and certainly not nearly as violent uh, following the killing of uh, Nichols by black cops than they were uh, of George Schwerman and the other white cops killing of George uh, of Floyd. Um, black lives matter, uh, of course they do, but they apparently to some people matter more if they're killed by white people than if they're killed by black people, and that's just not acceptable. Um, and it's being taught. And what is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a perversely anti-Semitic doctrine. It basically says that all oppressed groups, uh, except Jews, uh, work together uh, to cause the oppression. So uh, blacks and gays and Latinos uh, all work together and, and the, the discrimination against them is intersectional. Um, each supports the other, but Jews aren't part of it because they're really, they're, they're, they're the oppressors. Uh, and they're teaching this in the schools. Uh, they're teaching this and they're saying, you know, if you're a Jew or if you're a Zionist, you can't be oppressed or you can't be part of intersectionality. It's, it's uh, uh, only for people um, who, who don't uh, fit the oppressor class. And, if, and Jews are oppressors because they're white. Of course, for generations, white people, white Christians, didn't regard Jews as white. Uh, they oppressed them because they weren't white, and now they're being oppressed because they were white. Look, you can have all the arguments you want about that in a bar. You can have all the arguments you want on you know, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, but not in a public school classroom. That's not the place for it. And even if you wanted to have an argument about those issues, the teacher can take a point of view on that. If you want to talk about these issues, the teacher has to be the moderator, the facilitator, and the teacher has to be absolutely neutral and fair the way I tried to be for 50 years teaching at Harvard. But I don't trust teachers today. I just simply don't trust them. There's only one group of people I trust less than teachers, and that is politicians. So there is the dilemma. And we're seeing it played out in Florida today with Governor DeSantis. So he wants government, politicians, him, the state legislature, city councils, government to determine what can be taught in the elementary schools. And he's tried to rid the curriculum of discussions uh, of race and sex, depending on the age of the students and all that. And now, of course, uh, college boards uh, and AP courses has made decisions about what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. It's become extremely uh, politicized. And so the real debate is not what should be taught. We can have that debate. And um, I think 
many people would agree it shouldn't be pop propaganda. And what is one person's propaganda is another person's education. But the real question is, there's almost always in democracies is who decides? Who gets to make the decision? Um, and, and the question is, there are only really two sources of who can make, maybe three, but the educators themselves, the teachers, the principals, the board of education, etc. That's one group. Uh, that's what the left wants. They want uh, only teachers to make decisions about what can be taught. We know what they'll teach if teachers make that decisions. Um, and, um, and then the other side, the other side says, no, 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 the people pay, the people, we're taxpayers. Let the politicians, let the state legislatures decide. I don't know which is the worst answer. They both are terrible. Um, I don't trust the government to tell teachers what to teach. And I don't trust teachers to tell students what to think. So I'm really curious what you think. Um, I, can you think of a third alternative? I guess you can always go to the third alternative, a panel of experts, um, distinguished people, former presidents of universities, former Supreme Court justices, uh, a commission. Uh, it's an easy way out, but I am not sure that will do any more because who will the commission be comprised of? Probably both teachers and politicians and um, who will win uh, depending on the numbers of more politicians, more teachers. You know, I overstated, obviously, and I stereotype a little bit. There are some teachers who are fair or good. I had some great teachers in school. I had some terrible teachers in school. Um, and there are some good politicians, and there are some terrible politicians. And, you know, politicians have one goal, to get reelected. Teachers more and more have another one goal, not to get fired and not to be canceled. And that is a, a dramatic, has a dramatic impact on on what is taught. Um, you know, you go to parent teachers association meetings and you don't want to be attacked by the parents. So you, you become milk toast. And, and, um, and that's not a terrible thing to be if you're a teacher. Um, I, I don't want teachers uh, to become um, uh, MSNBC or CNN or, or Fox. Uh, I don't want teachers to be kind of pundits who express all their opinions about everything. Look, we can't stop teachers from expressing their opinions outside the classroom. Um, but inside the classroom, that makes all the difference in the world. And particularly when the education is compulsory. I mean, I've seen cases over and over again. There's a case now pending in George Washington University about a professor who's a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I don't know, but, but not an MD, but a PhD, a woman who uh, teaches, you know, that. Uh, that uh, Israel is a genocidal state and that Jews are evil and that uh, only the Palestinians uh, have rights and Israel shouldn't exist as the nation state of the Jewish people. She's entitled to express that view outside the classroom, but not inside the classroom. She's not entitled to grade students based on their agreement or disagreement with her point of view. And George Washington University is now looking into this issue. And I think the United States government um, is looking into this issue because a bunch of students who objected to her teaching, they got disciplined rather than the teacher being uh, disciplined. These are students who felt completely oppressed by this teacher. And it was a required course, as I understand it. So um, this is not a solvable issue easily. This is a problem that's going to persist and it's going to get worse. You know, when I was going to school, the worst problem we had was boredom. Our teachers were so boring, most of them, that uh, we just sit, sit there and twiddle our thumbs and, uh, and, and play tic-tac-toe. Um, but today, that's not the problem. Uh, there are some very charismatic teachers, very exciting teachers. Teachers really get the rapt attention of the students, and then they're propagandizing them. Uh, again, uh, I think, for me, it's very simple. A teacher has one job to teach the students how to think, how to be critical, how to be critical thinkers, how to be critical citizens, how to read critically, uh, how to analyze arguments critically. Now, obviously, if you're teaching science or math, there's substance, you have to teach the substance, but there's nothing political about math, nothing political about science. Even when you get to history, you know, you say there are two points of view uh, on this. Um, uh, 
was uh, did did uh, the slavery trade uh, really begin in 1600? Was America founded on slavery? Could it have survived without slavery? That's one argument. Present the students with some writing on that. Then present students with the opposing point of view. You know, when I was teaching in college, not law school, I was teaching at Harvard College, and I was teaching a course called Where Does Your Morality Come From? And I purposely gave the students incredibly provocative writings. For example, when we dealt with race, I gave them the writings of racist um, politicians like Calhoun, uh, who justified slavery. I made them read an essay justifying slavery. Then I made them write an essay showing why that was wrong. Express your critical thinking. Or I would give them two essays, one on one side of the issue, one on the other side of the issue. Um, with my Jewish students, I would give them Dostoevsky's essay on the Jews. Dostoevsky was a patent anti-Semite who wrote horrible stuff about Jews, but I gave them the essay. Answer it. What's wrong with it? What is he saying that's wrong? How would you have analyzed that problem? That's what teaching is all about, and that's what education is all about, but not in many parts of the United States today. So I'm interested in your view. Here's the question I throw to you. Who should decide what's taught in public elementary and high schools about race, about gender, about uh, sexual conduct, uh, and a range of other issues that are extremely, extremely controversial? Who decides what's taught in the curriculum of those schools. That's your, that's your assignment for, for next week. Uh, let's turn to uh, some letters. Um, the vast majority of letters that I got were responding to the question of why there wasn't more agitation, uh, particularly among civil rights activists and uh, African-American activists, Black Lives Movement, et cetera. Why was there so much more agitation uh, and violence uh, about the killing of um, George Floyd by white policemen than there was about the killing of Nichols by um, black policemen? Um, a number of people wrote and said, well, particularly since the killing of Nichols was much, much, much worse. And well, a lot of letters along those lines saying, and I, I'm not telling you I agree with that. I'm telling you this is what the consensus was among the letters I got that George Floyd was resisting, he was high on drugs, uh, he may have died of an overdose, uh, um, it was an accident, uh, sure, it was uh, overreaction by the police, but the police didn't intend for him uh, to be beaten or to be hurt, they were just trying to subdue him. That seems like an overstatement, whereas uh, in the Nichols case, almost everybody seemed to agree that the beating was deliberate and was unprovoked and there was no justification for it. And the police should have known that beating people like that with batons and, and kicks and all of that could easily lead to death. And, and, and so many of you wrote that the um, Nichols killing was far worse than the, um, than the killing uh, of, of George Floyd. Now, George Floyd's killing was, to me, the, the single most important transformative event of the 21st century. Um, it um, caused this reckoning. It caused universities, corporations, uh, uh, police departments, uh, the, everybody to uh, look hard in the, in the mirror and, and, and ask themselves questions about, about race. Uh, that didn't happen with, with the Nichols case. And so some people offered explanations. Um, you know, the obvious explanation that many people gave was that uh, the killing of Nichols was done by black officers as a black police chief in, in Memphis. And, and therefore, it didn't fit into the racist narrative. Of course, some tried to fit it into the racist narrative, saying, you know, it's the white racists who appoint black policemen to do their dirty work, beating up black people, etc. That That seems to me to be a bit overstated. So I got a lot of letters like that. I got some letters saying, that the real issue is police training, and now they racialize this issue, saying police training has suffered uh, as the result of quotas, affirmative action, race-based affirmative action, uh, bringing, quote, and this is again, I'm giving you my letters, less qualified African-American policemen than white policemen. I've seen no evidence to 
uh, support that, um, but that's one of the arguments that was uh, made. Um, another argument that was made in a couple of letters was there really is no racial disparity um, in, in police um, violence against um, arrested people, that uh, African-American people are not subject to worse treatment than whites are. Uh, you know, people throw around numbers, statistics, only 27% of police beatings were uh, black people, even though black people only constitute about a little more than a third of that, less than half of that. Um, uh, but they say, well, but people arrested is a higher percentage of blacks. But even that raises questions. Why? Why are why are arrest rates higher? Why are stopping traffic stops? I mean, the Nichols case is a perfect example. Would he have been stopped if he was white? Was he stopped uh, on the basis of driving while black? Or did he really commit a uh, violation? There were, you know, allegations that he was driving on the wrong side of the street. That's very serious. People, lots of people get killed as the result of people driving on the opposite side of the street. And so if that was true, that was a justification for stopping. If it wasn't true, then there is no uh, justification for stopping. You know, it's interesting. Um, um, I met just the, the other day with the former police commissioner of Boston and New York, um, uh, a really, really excellent um, a guy. And um, when I was living in Boston, there was a dramatic decrease in black on black crime in African American neighborhoods, particularly Roxbury and a few other neighborhoods in, in, in Boston. And it was as a result of the police working hand in hand with, with really responsible black leaders who were trying to reduce uh, gangland crime uh, among black gangs. And what they did is they very aggressively took the guns away from um, these gang members. And um, some people accused uh, the police of violating the Fourth Amendment, of taking guns away without probable cause. And, you know, there probably were some questions about that. They did use stop and frisk. Uh, they would stop people on the street uh, based on mere suspicion and pat them down. If they had a gun, they would take the gun away. Um, whatever you might think of that constitutionally, in fact, it reduced crime very significantly. And the credit for that really belonged to uh, both African-American leaders who worked diligently with the police and very, very effective uh, police work on the part of uh, Commissioner Bratton and, and other leaders of both the police community and the black community. And that is a model that other cities should, should look at. Boston became a real model for reduced crime and reduced violence uh, by police against blacks. And, um, uh, you know, Boston has a he terrible history of, of racism, even you know, post-1954, um, uh, there were segregated schools. You, re you may remember there were all kinds of uh, uh, disputes about busing and violence. And, um, but, and, and, you know, Bill Russell, who was uh, the great basketball star, a friend of mine, um, who I loved watching, um, you know, complained about even he, who was a great hero in Boston, you know, experienced uh, lots of lots of, of racism uh, that that still existed. Now, systemically, no, I don't think so. Systemically, Boston was fine. Um, it was uh, pockets of of racism among some people, and the police did a very good job, uh, along with the commissioners of uh, and some black leaders, particularly two or three black religious leaders, uh, ministers. Uh, who really didn't want to take advantage of racial conflicts, who wanted to really solve them. And so people should look to the Boston experience to see if we can create a, a better atmosphere uh, regarding race relations and the police. So my homework assignment again for, for next week is think about who should make decisions about what should be taught in public elementary and high schools regarding sex, uh, gender, and uh, race. See you next week.